If you're a wealthy individual looking to purchase an ultra luxury sedan that's a little bit more rare versus your neighbor's S-Class or 7 Series, the Bentley Flying Spur has fit that bill perfectly. Now, when Bentley first introduced the all new third generation back in 2020, it was actually a radical departure from the old model because it was built on an all new architecture. It had brand new powertrains and it had a brand new infotainment system, along with a design that mimicked, of course, its two door sibling, the Continental GT. Now, of course, fast forward a few years and Bentley is getting ready to introduce a new generation of vehicles with new powertrains that are electrified. But for 2024, the company is kind of giving the final send off to its beloved four liter V8 with the introduction of this vehicle. This is the 2024 Bentley Flying Spur Edition 8. It has that 542 horsepower engine under the hood, and it also has some unique badging and unique trim work to give this vehicle an even more special feel versus the regular versions of the Flying Spur. So as you can see this week, we are driving around in this Titan Gray Flying Spur Edition 8. And the big question I want answered for those of you who have the means to be able to afford a vehicle like this, should you still be putting a Flying Spur at the top of your list? Stay tuned to find out. So when you can afford a vehicle that has a $200,000 plus price tag, the styling is obviously going to be an important part. But before we start talking about the design of the Flying Spur, let me go ahead and pop the hood and show you guys what's powering this vehicle. Now here in America, Bentley offers a choice of three different powertrain options, although last year was technically the last model year of their beloved 12 cylinder, but most of them of course are gonna ship with this four liter twin turbocharged V8. Now, if you can believe it, this V8 is also about to be discontinued in the Flying Spur because this has been known as the base engine for a few years. There's also a plug-in hybrid twin turbo V6 that you can also add for around $7,000. The 12 cylinder, which the last model year was last year, was around $50,000 more versus the uh, V8 engine. But this engine is still a wonderful powertrain. It's shared, of course, with a lot of performance Audi and Porsche products. It's the company's four liter twin turbocharged gasoline direct injection double overhead cam V8. Uh, which makes 542 horsepower and 568 pound-feet of torque. This engine, of course, is a German-produced engine. It's all hooked up to an eight-speed dual-clutch transmission. It's essentially Porsche's, or Bentley's version of Porsche's famed PDK, but the company's engineers spent a lot of time tuning out the jerkiness at low speeds that you typically uh, feel with a dual-clutch transmission. It all goes out through, of course, an all-wheel drive system. Uh, with a center uh, differential lock, I believe. Uh, and this vehicle with launch control should be able to hit 60 miles an hour in 3.9 seconds. It has a top speed of 198 miles an hour. So basically a 200 mile per hour sedan, which is what you expect when you're paying for this kind of money. And as this vehicle sits, it weighs in at just over 5,100 pounds. Now fuel economy, in case you're wondering, is rated at 15 in the city, 20 on the highway. That's of course on premium gas. This car is hit with a $1,500 gas guzzler tax, but with that 24 gallon fuel tank, you're looking at around 430 to 450 miles of range, which is honestly excellent. The plug-in hybrid model obviously is gonna give you even better efficiency and up to 30-ish miles of all electric range. But uh, this V8, even though it's the base powertrain, should deliver a uh, really great performance. It does, however, have a lot of weight to move around because this is a big luxury sedan. But let's go ahead and close up the hood and talk about the exterior styling. Now, obviously this car has been around since 2020. Bentley hasn't really given it any kind of updates in terms of the exterior design, but we should be seeing that soon, potentially for the 2025 or 2026 model year. We just saw the updated version of the Continental GT. It's a heavy, heavy refresh, even though Bentley's calling, calling it a redesign. But you can see with the Flying Spur, the hood is just very broad. It's a wide vehicle. It's also got a very long hood, so it could fit that 12-cylinder engine. My test car for $5,300 also has the Flying B hood ornament, which is kind of like uh, Bentley's version of the Spirit of Ecstasy logo that Rolls-Royce does. You can see this logo also lights up. You can get it in either a gold, a chrome, uh, a nickel finish, or this black finish. I particularly love the way that looks. It rises and lowers with the push of a button. And if you tried to you know, steal this thing, it'll also retract itself back into the actual grill. The Edition 8 includes the black line specification. So it blacks out all the chrome. It all has that vertical slat there, which is an homage to uh, classic Bentleys. And then you can see the headlights have this kind of jewel crystal finish to them. I just absolutely love them. I love the four point look with the LEDs. The new Continental GT has just a single uh, twin headlight design as opposed to the four. You can see you have an LED turn signal, LED daytime running lights, LED low and high beams. Down here, it looks like fog lights, but that's actually the radar sensor for the adaptive cruise. You have front cameras, parking sensors uh, throughout the vehicle. Of course, it's supposed to be a modern car, but it just looks very classic. It looks very um, timeless in its design. 
Even though it's been on the market for five years, it's still a car that attracts a lot of heads everywhere that you take it. Even in this Titan gray exterior, I don't particularly love this color combination. I just think it's a little too mundane. Bentley offers a choice of several different bright colors. This is kind of building off of the high class Mullinger uh, trim that you can wear, where you can basically specify this car to your heart's content. Remember, these are all hand built in England. Now, in terms of the overall length, this is a big luxury sedan at 100, or I'm sorry, at 209 inches long with a 126 inch long wheelbase. Its main rival, However, the Mercedes-Benz or the Mercedes Maybach S-Class is around six inches longer. This is around three inches shorter than a, a BMW 7 Series, of course. A Rolls-Royce Ghost is also uh, around 10 inches longer as well. So keep in mind, this is not the longest vehicle in the class, but it's also still a big car. You can take your pick between either two types of 22 inch wheels. It's standard on the Edition 8, either this five spoke design or a 10 spoke design. You got these massive rotors behind it clamped down by six piston black painted calipers. You have an all independent air suspension. My test car has the optional Bentley uh, ride, active ride with the uh, dynamic rear wheel steering, of course. You have a 275 by 35 R22 tire. It's a fatter 315 with tire at the rear. So again, a staggered setup, even though this is all wheel drive. Uh, there are a couple of uh, fake vents over here, which I would have preferred these to be functional, uh, but you can see with the black line specification, it blacks that out versus the chrome. You have power folding mirrors, which I'm surprised this is not blacked out. I appreciate the blacked out trim here. You have a panoramic sunroof, which is an up optional $3,700 that my test car has, of course which is a, a nice option that I would personally go for. There's a subtle Edition 8 badge here. You're gonna find more Edition 8 badging inside the vehicle. Uh, the wheels also have this self-leveling B badge there. So basically these always stay upright, even when the vehicle is moving, which is kind of a cool thing. It's uh, something that these luxury, Uber luxury cars really pride themselves on. And then looking at the rear, you can see the design is a little bit more plain Jane to me, although it still is instantly recognizable as an expensive car just because of how wide this vehicle is. You can see the rear taillights are full LED. They have almost like that crystal-like effect as the headlights, but it's not quite as intricate as the headlights. You can see it also resembles a B when the actual light signature is on. That's definitely uh, pretty cool to remind you that this is a Bentley. I love the Bentley logo as well. You have signature quad outlet exhaust system. The reverse light is located in the actual bumper. You have rear parking sensors, cameras, of course. And then the Flying Spur is a traditional sedan and you get a pretty usable 15.8 cubic feet of space back here. You can see uh, the rear seats backs themselves. They don't fold down. It looks like you have a pass through, however. Uh, but it's certainly a very usable amount of space. You have nice metal accents, plush carpeting here. And then if you look underneath the floor here, you can see the battery, the 12 volt battery lives back here. There's also a fix a flat kit. Uh, there's no spare tire, obviously a little bit of storage here, but not really. Uh, but overall, uh, the trunk capacity of the Flying Spur is certainly usable. This actually does have a little bit more trunk space versus its main rival, the Mercedes Maybach S-Class. So on the outside of the Flying Spur Edition 8, obviously this thing commands attention in its design, but the interior is really where, you know, these ultra luxury vehicles need to be spent uh, the majority of their time in because the interior of this vehicle is hand built and it has some really exquisite materials. Before we get inside, let me show you guys the key fob. You can see this is a unique Bentley key fob. As you guys know, Bentley is under the Volkswagen umbrella, but I love the way this key looks with the metal and chrome piano black trim, the Bentley badge. It also feels heavy and hefty. It feels like a high quality key. It has usual buttons for unlock, lock, open for the trunk, and then a panic function. Um, I don't believe Bentley has remote start from the fob or any kind of phone access through an app. So if you guys are an owner of this vehicle, let me know in the comment section below if you guys can remote start it. But other than that, as you approach the vehicle, you can see traditional door handles. If I touch that little area there, it has that trademark Volkswagen, Porsche, Audi chirp. The mirrors will also fold in. This vehicle does not have an auto lock or uh, walk away auto lock or unlock feature like you might find from some competitors. Now touch the back of the door handle. You can see that opens up the doors or unlocks the doors. But this vehicle doesn't have, however, are the automatic opening and closing doors that you might find in a Rolls Royce or a Mercedes. So that's something to keep in mind. I'll be curious to see if Bentley introduces that for the next generation. Now you can see my test car in the Titan gray exterior is complemented by this uh, Beluga a full leather interior. This is like an upgraded premium leather with the contrast yellow stitching with the Edition 8 badging embossed on the actual seat back. That is unique and exclusive, of course, to this trim. And you also have the yellow stitching that matches on the steering wheel and on the actual third spoke. 
and on the shifter. It's a really nice looking color combination. I just personally wouldn't spec in this really dark interior color with the dark exterior. I just would prefer a lighter, warmer tone. But again, that's a personal preference, but it's still, this makes a wonderful first impression and it just smells really expensive in this car. This is, remember, a hand-built vehicle in England. Now you can see the door panels have beautiful leather stitching with contrast, or leather with contrast yellow stitching. This aluminum trim here is an extra $4,300 for the dark tinted aluminum engine turned trim that is unique of course to this model you can see you have more of that yellow stitching beautiful chrome and metal accents for the door handles i love the jeweled look how it's just so sparkly the window controls they are bespoke to bentley they feel high quality and tactile you have uh, automatic uh, auto dimming rear view mirrors along with a power fold feature you have two person memory on the driver and the passenger side as well with leather covering here the name audio system in this car uh, is $9,600 extra, almost 10 grand extra. If you're an audio file, file, highly recommend that option. My test car also has the aluminum sport pedals for an extra 700 bucks, along with the plusher high pile carpet mats for an extra $700, so kind of keep that in mind. These seats are also, I believe, like 20 or 24 way adjustable. You can see, I like the traditional location for the seat controls. It also offers an active massage feature, and these are heated and ventilated. Uh, that's standard equipment, thankfully. Uh, I remember you have to spec up an option for that, but it's again, very comfortable and really well-lined interior. I also love the fact that the leather continues along this lower portion here. It's stitched leather everywhere, including here. Uh, and it just makes for a really high-end interior that feels a lot nicer again, versus a regular S-Class or 7 Series. Now getting inside, you can see the step-in is traditional sedan. It's a little bit low. As I shut the door, obviously I have to pull the door. It's such an inconvenience because I don't have soft or automatic closing doors. It does have, however, a soft close feature, which is what you expect. Or again, if you just want to traditionally slam it, the door has a really solid sounding thunk. Remember, this is built off of the MSB architecture that also underpins the Porsche Panamera. Now starting the car up, the start-stop button is located here right below the shifter. And this car is not a hybrid or a mild hybrid, so you have a traditional starter noise for the engine. And the engine itself, when you put it into sport mode, it has a very soft limiter, but it has a muted, understated growl to it that just reminds you why you love V8 engines if you're an enthusiast. Now, of course, looking at the rest of this interior, this is pretty similar to the last flying spur that I tested, so I'm not gonna go into too much detail here. You can see there's still a 12.3 inch fully digital instrument cluster where you can kind of customize the way this looks. You can also put your phone audio information, GPS information here, although it doesn't quite give you the full screen GPS like what you'll find in some Audi products. The steering wheel itself is pretty much the same high-end steering wheel you've seen in some Audis with a unique Bentley badging here, the Bentley chrome accents. Um, you have a power tilt telescoping function as well, along with these metal accented paddle shifters. Your cruise control is controlled here via the adaptive cruise. That's part of the touring specification. And then the horn, it sounds pretty nondescript, <clears throat> uh, but it also says, get out of my way. I mean, this car already says that anyways because of the big B on the hood and that flying B hood ornament, uh, which is really nice. I also love the stocks here. The turn signal stocks are bespoke to Bentley. There is a couple of buttons in here that will remind you of an Audi, but everything else is very unique to Bentley. I also love the leather stitching that goes across the dash here. With the contrast stitching, the quality, build quality is just impeccable. You have a heads-up display here. I also love the uh, way the dash vents look. Sadly, they are just metal plated. They are not the full metal that you get in a Rolls Royce where it makes that satisfying clink noise, but this still looks very nice. You have these chrome accented organ pulls to open and close the vents, which I very much appreciate as well. Your headlight controls are here. And then over here, you get the standard 12.3 inch display. My test car also has the uh, rotating display, which is typically an extra 6,000 bucks, but for some reason, Bentley's not charging it to you on this model, which I, mean, which I believe means it, it's gonna be standard with the counter rotating display on the Edition 8. You can see going back to the display here, uh, that's what it looks like when you're trying to adjust a couple of sources. Going to the car icon here, you can adjust a couple of things here. This is where you can open and close the uh, Bentley Flying B logo. So right now it's revealed. If I hit conceal, you can see it actually goes down and you can even see it going down there from the hood. Gives you a really cool graphic. Uh, most of the times, however, I love it in automatic mode where it essentially just, when the vehicle is locked, it goes away. When it's unlocked, it's going to be standing out. Now this car does have Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. However, it's not wireless. I can't connect it right now because I'm, I'm using my phone to film. But when you do have it connected, uh, it's basically only taking about three quarters of the screen. It also has embedded GPS built in. And then if I put the vehicle into reverse, um, you can see it gives you a full 360 camera 
uh, with trajectory and distance markers, obviously. The one thing I'm noticing, however, is to show the rear trajectory, I have to first go into the front camera and then hit rear again, and that brings up the rear trajectory. It does that every time. I'm not entirely sure if that's a setting that I can mess. I, I tried my best to kind of look around for that. But that kind of annoyed me a little bit. It also has cross-traffic braking for the rear. Obviously, you have different views. That's gonna be standard equipment, of course, on this car, which you better expect it will give you, of course, at this price point. Um, but overall, the infotainment system is a little bit of a disappointment. Um, the software behind it is a little bit slow and laggy, but at least it is a touchscreen and it does have into phone integration, but it's just not wireless. I expect Bentley to add wireless Apple CarPlay in their latest software for the next generation model, which they just showed in the Continental GT for 2025. Down here, you can see the, uh, I, I really love this analog clock. It's got, again, chrome accents, uh, metal plated covers for the dash fence. You have the same organ pulls here. You have a wireless phone charging pad here. You connect your smartphone here via a USB-A charging port. So again, showing you your age of the vehicle, uh, the shifter, is kind of an electronic shifter, but you push the little B here uh, while you're when you're trying to shift gears, push the P button here to go to park. You have your tri-zone or quad zone automatic climate control, obviously your drive mode selector is here. There's a sport, a B mode, a comfort, and a custom. So there's four drive modes, pretty simple. Your electronic parking brake here, these little controls open and close the shades back there. And then you have your parking sensors, your auto start, stop, defeat. There's a little compartment here that opens up the cup holders, which are a fairly decent size. There's not much in this car in terms of storage. You can see there's a little bit of storage here and you can use this as storage. I also hate the piano black. It shows fingerprints and scratches and dust really easily. Um, this little center console here moves forward and back, but it doesn't open. That really annoys me. It's just like in the Flying Spur I had last year. This doesn't open. I don't know if it opens in the in other markets, but in the Continental GT, it does open, I believe, to give you some storage. So this is kind of infuriating. This is nice and padded, of course. So it's a nice armrest, obviously. And then the seats, they're really plush. They're comfortable. The massage function works really well. I also love the yellow accents. The heated and cooled function works well, which is what you expect, of course, in a vehicle of this caliber. You can see the glove compartment is damped and lined with felt. It's a pretty good size. I also love how this is covered in leather. I love the metal speaker accents for the name audio system, uh, which is also, again, adding to the whole glitz and glam of this interior. Visibility is good. There's a lovely woven material, or I'm sorry, Alcantara material on the headliner, and you also have leather covers or leather stitching for the actual sun visors. This glass roof, as you can see, is a panoramic style. It also has a retractable shade, obviously, uh, if you want, and you can also open this up to vent air or tilt it if you want. It opens up completely to like give you more access to the fresh air, which is nice, or more light, which is good because this interior is pretty dark, but overall this cabin is definitely still one of the nicest interiors you're gonna find. It's just showing its age in terms of the technology, but in terms of build quality and feel, this is gonna be among the best that you're gonna see. And it's gonna feel definitely nicer uh, versus in luxury versus like a regular S-Class, an A8 or uh, a 7 Series. Moving to the back seat of the Flying Spur, you can see this vehicle only comes in one wheelbase configuration. Uh, and it does give you among one of the spacious rear, most spacious rear seats you're gonna find in the class. You can see this particular model offers around 43 inches of legroom in the second row, which is great for those of you who wanna be driven around in this car. But just keep in mind, the Maybach competitor offers around five more inches of rear seat legroom. Now you can see back here, the door panel has the same beautiful leather stitching with metal, metal here, leather covering the entire door panels. Although I'm surprised the rear speaker cover here is not also covered in metal. You can also adjust the rear seats and activate a massage function. There's two per in memory on both outboard rear seats, which is what you expect, along with the, obviously, the power retractable peasant blockers, which you can expect a feature like that when you're looking to spend this amount of money. But let me go ahead and get inside this interior. You can see back here, sadly, there's no automatic closing rear door, so I have to be so inconvenienced and pull that door shut. It does have a soft close feature, obviously, for the rear door, which is nice, but if you want, you can also slam it normally, and it has a nice solid sounding thunk. There is a ton of space back here, I will say. This is where I'd have the vehicle to drive. I can literally stretch my legs out. I can cross my legs easily. Uh, I can kind of adjust the seat if I want and kind of stretch it out further to kind of give me a re reclined, relaxed feel. If I want to take a nap, you can see it actually lets you pull that out pretty far. And then this is pretty much the most it'll let you do. So when I'm sitting like this, it basically feels like I'm in like a recline function in a uh, first class air airplane, which is nice. Uh, most of you are probably going to more likely sit upright. I also love the fact that you have nice details here. So you have vents right here and vents right here for the rear seat climate. There's also leather stitching over here and to this lower portion here, which is really nice. 
Uh, and then over here in the center console area, you can see you have metal accents for the vents. You have the same organ pulls. You have a small screen over here. I believe that's like maybe five inches. Uh, there is the option of a, of a rear seat entertainment package where you can have it mounted here, but my test car is missing that. Uh, over here, you can see you have a, your own retractable shade. This doesn't actually open up, however, to vent air, but you can see when you open up the shade, this is definitely going to let in some more light. You also have these little convex mirrors here where you can basically check to do your makeup or your hair, uh, along with some LED map lighting as well. And then the other cool party trick about this screen is, as you can see, I also have my own uh, ability here to kind of close and open the vent, uh, the shades, obviously. I want to close that rear shade here. You can see that helps to close that up, which is nice. And I can also close again uh, some of the blinds, which is accessed via there. And then the other cool thing is if I push that right there, you can see this screen pops out so I don't have to reach and you know look down there. It's just kind of a pain. Um, but most of the times, you know, this little screen, which is recharged when it's connected to the dock there, you can see this is where you can access a couple of things. So you can even access the Flying Bee ornament where you can make it pop in and out. You can change the ambient lighting in this car. So this is a really cool feature, but the screen is starting to look a little bit small. It easily pops back in there, which is nice. Uh, over here, you can see there are uh, some cup holders, a little bit more storage here with two USB charging ports, a 12 volt outlet, uh, but no traditional outlet. You can see, open this up. You can fit a third person here, but why would you do that? There's a big hump here and this seat seems rather narrow. Most of you will have this folded down uh, and basically have it as a two plus two. I also love the plush pillows that you get back here. It's just a really, you know, amazing place to spend time. But again, if you're looking for even more space, even more luxury uh, and champagne flutes, for example, you'll find that in the Rolls Royce. I think you can get it in the Bentley, but I just couldn't find it in their build sheet configurator. But again, that's where the Maybach and the Rolls come into play. They are just better vehicles to be driven in. This car you know, can be driven in, but it's better suited as a driver's car, which you guys will find out when we get this vehicle out on the road. So I've been really fortunate enough to be able to drive a few Bentley vehicles in the last couple years. And this week, as you can see, Bentley has loaned us essentially the final send off to the uh, twin turbocharged four liter V8 that you can get in this car, along with the Continental GT, of course, and the GTC. Uh, but as Bentley prepares to essentially replace this engine with a plug-in hybrid version, or perhaps even a different engine that kind of slots below the plug-in hybrid, let's go ahead and reminisce on how good this powertrain is in this fantastic car. Now, as you guys know, if you watched my previous review on the Flying Spur, this generation came out in 2020. It's built on the same MSB architecture that also underpins the Porsche Panamera. So it's definitely one of the more sportier driving Uber luxury sedans in the class. The last one that I drove was the Speed version, which had the company's twin turbocharged W12. That one was unbelievably blisteringly fast. This model makes 542 horsepower from a four liter twin turbo V8 hooked up to an eight speed dual clutch transmission, essentially Bentley version of Porsche's PDK, and of course, all wheel drive. Let's go ahead and see if we can get zero to 60 wise here. Uh, we have it in its sport mode. It does have launch control, so just brake torque it. Oof. <laughs> 3.83 <laughs> seconds there, which is a smidge quicker versus Bentley's claim of 3.9. Now, I did that same acceleration run on the same stretch of road in the Continental GT, which this had the same powertrain a couple months ago, or at least a month ago, and that did it in 3.4 seconds. This model is around 400 pounds heavier versus its coupe counterpart, so it doesn't surprise me that it is a smidge slower, but still 3.8 is incredibly quick. The speed version is a few tenths of a second faster, obviously. I think I got 3.4 in the speed version. So this is still a very quick car. And this engine is just such a gem. It's so smooth. It's so quick uh, to basically give you gobs of torque anytime you want it. And the transmission also is among the best that you're going to find for dual clutches. Let's try another run here. This time it's a little more uphill, however. Oof. <laughs> Oh, that sounds good. 3.85 seconds there. Uh, now I'm surprised, the one thing I'm surprised about is it's not revving the engine out as hard as it used to, or at least as hard as it did in the GT, uh, the Continental GT Coupe, which dumps the clutch at like 5,000 RPM. But for some reason in this car, I'm not able to get it to rev up higher, but still 3.85 there. And that's with it more going slightly uphill. So this thing is quick. I mean, it's gonna be quicker versus its main rival like the Mercedes Maybach S580, which Mercedes claims 4.7 seconds for that model. And you can also attribute that to, I guess, more power versus the, the Maybach 
uh, and of course a little bit less weight I believe. This car also comes with the uh, Bentley Active Ride Control so it has their adaptive dampers and So it has their adaptive dampers. It also has active rear wheel steering, which is uh, gonna help shrink the overall length of this car. Because remember, we're still driving around in a big luxury sedan that weighs in at around uh, 5,100, 5,200 pounds. It still also is around 209 inches long. So it's a pretty big vehicle. Uh, and this car drives a lot smaller than it is, but it also feels bigger than the GT two-door, obviously, because it's around 10 inches longer versus the Continental GT, but it's still among the more sportier driving cars. The steering is sharp, the suspension stays nice and flat, but it also delivers an impeccable ride quality. Even though we're on these big 22 inch wheels, this thing just glides over bumps. Now, is it the same kind of ride quality as the Rolls-Royce Ghost? Well, the Rolls-Royce is known for their magic carpet ride the Bentley comes pretty darn close, but I just love the sound and the shift quality of this powertrain. The four liter twin turbo V8 just delivers effortless power everywhere. And what I love about this dual clutch is it's Porsche's PDK, but Bentley engineering team has really tuned out all of the shift shock and like the jerkiness that you get at low speeds from a typical dual clutch. So this is all living up to the Bentley, you know, driving style of just serene luxury. Now let's try another zero to 60 run here. Uh, see if we can just consistently get that time. Oof. <laughs> Whoa, <laughs> 3.84 there. So another consistent 3.84 second run and that time is gonna be plenty fast for most. Keep in mind again, you can also look into a plug-in hybrid version of this car, which is a twin turbo V6. I haven't had a chance to personally drive that yet, but I'm really enjoying even just the base engine. Remember, this is a Bentley. You're, you're gonna be spending well over $200,000 and effortless luxury and you know refinement is pretty much on the menu every time you're looking at this specific uh, type of vehicle. But just driving the car normally, I'm gonna switch the drive mode into the Bentley mode. I've been in the sport mode. And the Bentley mode is just the perfect drive mode to where this car gives you a nice blend between luxury, comfort, quietness, but it also still gives you a little hint of sportiness. Uh, in this mode, the dampers get a little softer. The engine doesn't really have much in terms of sound. The exhaust system gets a little louder in sport mode, but it doesn't have the same pops and crackles from the coupe version. The coupe has been tuned specifically more for sporty driving dynamics, obviously, versus the sedan, but this is still you know, a very nice vehicle to drive in the corners. It still has a great sound to it. It's just a lot more muted. And in terms of the seats, these are among the most comfortable seats that I've ever driven in. Obviously, I'm sitting here getting a massage. It's got heated and ventilated seats. You have a unique seat material on this uh, Edition 8, obviously, with the yellow trim. It looks good. It feels good. It smells expensive in here. And I'm sitting here getting a massage, which is, you know, what I expect to be doing when I'm spending this kind of money on a vehicle. That's what I love about the, con the Flying Spur and the Continental is these are driver's cars. You'd never expect them to be driver's cars, but you can also, in this car at least, be driven around in it. Not quite in the same Uber levels of luxury or technology as the Maybach, obviously. This car feels a lot more classic, but it also feels a little bit dated. It feels a little bit more old school. But hey, if you like that kind of feeling to it, you're gonna find plenty to like about this car. It does have some driver assistance tech, like adaptive cruise control. My test car already has the touring specification that gives you the night vision display as well. It works perfectly fine, but it also feels like it's been around for the last decade or so, the technology has. I, I'm curious to see what Bentley is gonna do for the next generation flying spur. We've already seen the next generation Continental GT, although it's technically a very heavy refresh, but but, you know, Bentley, when they change their vehicles, they tend to be very conservative because, again, these, these types of vehicles, they are supposed to be feel, they're supposed to feel a lot more timeless. And that's kind of what this car feels like. Even though it is starting to feel dated, it is definitely still a timeless feeling design. Now, in terms of fuel efficiency, this V8 is hit with a gas guzzler tax, but it is a little bit more fuel efficient versus the, tub, the 12 cylinder engine. Get the twin turbo plug-in hybrid V6 if you want the best fuel efficiency. In my week's worth of testing, uh, I averaged around, uh, uh, 17 miles to the gallon in mostly city driving, which isn't wonderful. This car is rated at uh, 15 in the city, which actually is not is not bad. I was doing a mixture of city and highway driving. On the highway, this thing was able to do 25 mpg. So 25 is impressive. It's way more fuel efficient, obviously, on the highway where this thing, you know, has eight gears where it can get the, you know, the revs down nice and low for quietness, obviously 
for efficiency. Uh, with this big 24 gallon fuel tank, you're looking at around 420 miles of range. At least that's what I got in my actual testing. Premium is going to be required, obviously. If you can afford a Bentley, you should be able to put premium gas in this vehicle. Again, the plug-in hybrid twin turbo V6 is going to be the most fuel efficient model. I'll be curious to see uh, what this car is going to be like with the twin turbo V8 plug-in hybrid for obviously the next generation whenever Bentley decides to show us that. But overall, if you guys have the means to be able to afford a vehicle like this, there obviously aren't very many competitors to choose from. I mean, this car sits above vehicles like an S-Class or a 7 Series. It sits in the same ballpark as a Maybach S-Class or a Rolls-Royce Ghost, although Rolls-Royce would argue that Rolls-Royce doesn't have a competitor competitive set. But I think this is where the flying spur kind of fits in between those two vehicles perfectly. And if you prefer something with more traditional luxury, with a timeless design, with more driver's feel in terms of the handling dynamics, there's still a lot to like about the flying spur. But just keep in mind, if you want the latest technology and gadgets, this is where some of its competitors will certainly uh, be better a better pick for you. So I have to admit guys, in my line of work, being able to spend a full week with a vehicle like this that is really reserved for the basically top 1% or 2% of the population here in America, really reminds you that while money can't buy happiness, it can sur surely buy you some really nice damn things. Because after spending a week with this version of the Bentley Flying Spur, the Edition 8, I have to say everything that I loved about the Speed version last year is pretty much carried over into this vehicle. What surprised me, however, is the engine. Even though this is the base powertrain, a four liter twin turbo V8, it's zero to 60 time of 3.8 seconds is only about 0.3 to 0.4 seconds slower versus the 12 cylinder. Remember the eight cylinder saves you about $50,000 for those of you who are curious to save a little bit of money. So there's a lot of value to be had with the base eight cylinder engine. I'm also looking forward to eventually driving the plug-in hybrid twin turbo V6, which could be a nice middle ground, especially if you're looking for better fuel efficiency, some all electric range. But remember, Bentley is working on a new generation of the flying spur because we just saw the Continental GT with some big updates. Now in terms of the uh, this vehicle here, the Edition 8, I personally think that while it is a specialty model, obviously every version of the Flying Spur I think is gonna feel very special. So really you're only gonna choose this if you must have something that's kind of like a final send off because uh, this vehicle here with its you know really plush interior, comfortable seats, massaging seats, the infotainment is still very much a sour point. Obviously if you prefer something that's not so overwhelming with tech, this certainly will do it for you. But I really think that Bentley should have at some point added wireless Apple CarPlay and Android Auto to the, the, to the mix. Uh, and of course, uh, given us some more you know, up-to-date driver assistance tech, but hey, that's probably something that they're gonna reserve for the updated version at some point. The rear seat still coddles you in luxury, and even though it doesn't have quite the same levels of space and technology and just a wow factor as the Maybach S-Class, I'm hoping to be able to spend a week with that vehicle at some point. There is something just purely traditional and timeless about this car. And I think if you are into something like that, the Flying Spur is kind of like a great middle ground between going with the Maybach S-Class and going for the stupid expensive Rolls Royce, which is, you know, it makes this car seem like a bargain because if you're looking to get your hands on the Edition 8 version of this car, <clears throat> the Flying Spur for the base V8 starts at around $218,000. Shockingly, it's about $10,000 more versus the 2023 model year with essentially the same powertrain. I mean, just because they can, Bentley just keeps increasing the price. The Edition 8 uh, badging with all the extras it's gonna give you, including the black line specification, and the 22 inch wheels. This adds around $7,000 on top of that $218,000 price tag. So you're looking at 225. My test car has three really expensive options. The upgraded suspension with the active rear steering is almost nine grand. The name audio system is like $9,300 of course. Um, and uh, the touring specification is also around $9,300 as well. So with the all the options that this car also has, however, it has around $53,000 worth of options. The as tested price of this vehicle balloons to $282,250. That's right, almost 300 grand for this vehicle here. And keep in mind, if you guys go to like the Mullinger speed versions of this car back in the day, this car could easily top over $330,000. Now I know that's expensive, but consider the fact that a Rolls Royce Ghost starts at around $350,000. So that kind of makes this car look like a bargain. The Maybach S580 is probably the, again, the car's main rival. That starts at just under $200,000, around $235,000 if you guys want the 12 cylinder Maybach. So again, there is some value to be had here and this is still very much the driver's car in this segment. 
way more fun to drive versus the Mercedes or the Rolls Royce. But again, if you want the best technology and just something that feels a lot more modern, this is where you may want to check out its competitors or wait for the updated version to come out. But again, if you guys are, you know, one of the wealthy few people who can afford a vehicle like this and you want something that feels a lot more special than a 7 Series or an S-Class, because those cars, again, are just so plebeian, you see them everywhere, you should definitely still put a flying spur at the top of your list. But with all that said, hope you guys have enjoyed my full overview on the 2024 Flying Spur Edition 8. If you're also looking to see the latest cars I'm testing. Be sure to follow me on Instagram at redline underscore reviews. Like us on Facebook. And as always, guys, please keep subscribing to the Redline Reviews YouTube channel for all the latest reviews. Thank you so much for watching. I'll catch you all in the next video.